All right, without further delay, let's welcome our first speaker, Federal Member for Herbert, Cathy O'Toole. Uh, thank you. Before we start, or before I start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet, the Wulgarukaba and Bindal people, and pay my respect to their elders, past, present and future, and thank them for their stewardship of this land over many thousands of years. I would also like to acknowledge my fellow presenters, Senator Matt Canavan, uh, Cliff o from Hit FM, David Pello. I would also like to thank Kate for her MC role and James for the role he will take in moderation. I would like to thank each and every one of you for coming along this evening. I know there are people here in this room who are avid supporters of marriage equality. I want each of you to know that I stand firmly with you and that you have my full support in this fight for marriage equality. I also know that there are people here who are vehemently opposed to marriage equality and nothing that I could say or do will probably change your mind. But there are probably also people here this evening who genuinely want to know what this is all about. Put quite simply, this debate is about equality, human and legal rights. The simple facts are, fact number one, this is the survey to see if the nation does or does not agree with marriage equality. It is not a referendum or a plebiscite. We are not changing the constitution. Fact number two, Survey Monkey would have been a cheaper option. Fact number three, this is a non-binding survey. The results of this survey do not bind the government to do anything. Fact four, the question being proposed is specifically and only about the definition of marriage in the Marriage Act 1961. It is interesting to note that the Marriage Act of 1961 has been amended 22 times and each time by a vote in Parliament. Fact number five, $122 million of your taxpayer dollars has been spent on this non-binding survey. I would like to define the terms equality and rights uh, as they are defined in the Collins Dictionary. Equality is the same status, rights and responsibilities for all members of a society, group or family. Rights are those things that one is morally or legally entitled to do or have. And it is from that premise that I give my support to the Yes campaign. History shows that those who do not support changes that benefit or affect minority groups peddle myths and confusion to derail the focus on the real issues. We only need to look at the propaganda posted in the early 1900s by those who opposed the right to vote for women. Those vehemently opposed to women's right to vote because it would be a social disaster, because having a mother who votes would equate to children crying, having holes in their socks, and children would feel unloved. We can now say how ridiculous that is, but that is exactly what the No campaign peddled in the early 1900s. Interestingly, when comparing campaign posters, we don't see much difference in the rhetoric today. I'd just like you to look at these posters. Both campaigns depict families and children under threat. But with the gift of hindsight, we are able to see just how completely wrong the naysayers were. You, like those who voted for women's rights, women's right to vote in 1902, have a choice in 2017 to be on the right side of history. You can either be on the side that believes in equality, human and legal rights, or you can be on the side that believes in fear and propaganda. And the marriage equality debate is unfortunately just the same, but at a different point in time. Matt Canavan and the No campaign are trying to have you believe that your religious freedom is at risk. I am a practicing Catholic. I have a very strong spirituality, and I belong to the House of Prayer community, 
and often I come to Mass here in this very building. I do not and I never will support anything that restricts my values or beliefs or my right to express them. Churches have always been able to determine who they marry and who they won't marry and they will continue to do so. Matt Canavan and the No Campaign will have you believe that children are at risk of safe schools. The Postal Survey is not about the Safe Schools Program. This is an anti-bullying program. Matt Canavan has said that this debate wants to make it illegal to be able to express a different view about marriage. In actual fact, an analysis of one week's media coverage of the Postal Survey debate conducted by Stream reveals that the No campaign has had four times the media attention than the Yes campaign. What I would like you to understand is a yes vote will simply mean that same-sex couples can get married, be recognised legally as a next of kin, adopt, foster, use IVF or surrogacy to have children in a legal family structure and be a legally recognised family. If Australia is to truly be a country that values and supports a fair go for all, then that includes families in whatever form that may take. In 1902, women got the right to vote because the majority of Australians chose not to believe the fear-mongering propaganda of the No campaign. And in 2017, I am asking you to do the same. I am asking you to believe in and vote for human rights and equality for every citizen. I am asking you to believe in and vote for love over hate. This is your chance to stand up for the LGTBIQ community who are a minority group in our communities and give them marriage equality. The Prime Minister has declared a no vote in the postal survey would see the coalition rule it out for both this term and the next were he to be elected in 2019 election. This is our only chance with the Turnbull government to say yes and be on the right side of history. Finally, I would just like to say, as in the days when we allowed women to vote, the world did not end, the sun came up in the morning as it does every day, and it went down in the evening as it does every day. Women have made a significant contribution at every level in our community as a result of their right to vote and be able to stand in Parliament at a federal level. Changing the definition of marriage will not bring our community to a grinding halt, but it will speak volumes about how we as a nation value each and every citizen in our community, how we as a nation say that children need to be cared for loved, nourished, provided an education, a safe place to live, and nowhere does it say that that can only be done by a parenting arrangement that consists of a male and a female. I urge you to think very, very carefully about how you will vote in this survey, and I urge you to think about being on the right side of history and voting yes for equality. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I love uh, that this is Australia. There's so many nations in the world where we couldn't be doing this tonight, but there's no violent, bloody revolution. It's just democracy. And I love that people that even disagree deeply and passionately can, can still be friends afterwards, have a drink together, and disagree and just make democracy better. I know if I'm wrong, I want to find out about it sooner than later. So I'm really glad that we've got a broad spectrum here of people that both agree and disagree, because the last thing any of us want to do is live in an echo chamber, right? Anyway, this is my thoughts on why I'm going to vote no. There are more reasons to vote no to the redefinition of marriage than I can even summarise in five minutes. But most of all, 
I haven't yet heard a good reason to vote yes. It's an institution that has stood the test of time, despite tinkering and minor variations that has always valued the complementary and unique relationship between a man and a woman. Campaigners for traditional marriage are sometimes told that we're on the wrong side of history, and I swear I didn't read Kathy's notes. <laughs> but it's just not true. Apart from our inability to know what the future holds, such statements clearly do not know enough history. One of the goals of Marxism is to destroy the family unit. And after the Russian Revolution in 1917, exactly 100 years ago, Vladimir Lenin deemed anyone who supported traditional marriage an enemy of the revolution. They were to be publicly persecuted for daring to believe in one man and one woman for life. Of course, this was a terrible social experiment. And just over a decade later, even Stalin had to again promote traditional marriage for purely practical reasons. So no, supporters of traditional marriage are not on the wrong side of history. I do understand that most people supporting change have genuinely good motives, but there is more to this agenda than most people see. Lesbian activist Masha Gessen admitted the true goal in a rare moment of public transparency at the Sydney Writers' Festival. She said, It's a no-brainer that we should have the right to marry, but I also think equally that it's a no-brainer that the institution of marriage should not exist. Fighting for gay marriage generally involves lying about what we are going to do with marriage when we get there because we lie that the institution of marriage is not going to change, and that is a lie. The institution of marriage is going to change, and it should change, and again, I don't think it should exist. Redefining marriage is not truly about changing the meaning to be more inclusive. It is about removing the meaning altogether and destroying the family unit again, replacing it with the almighty state. But I do agree that we need to achieve equity in law for all individuals. As T Tanya Plibersek proudly agreed, we did that in 2008. In an interview with Lee Sales, she said, we removed every piece of legal discrimination against gay men, lesbians and same-sex couples on the statute books. There simply is no longer any inequality. And if there were any state laws that also needed updating to remove discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, then those laws need changing and not marriage. I would fight side by side with you to change those laws. It is also a silly claim that there will be no consequences to redefining marriage. Of course there will be. There are always consequences any time legislation is passed and it's reckless and irresponsible to not carefully weigh the possibilities and precedents every time before rushing in. So what has happened in Ireland, England, Canada and America in the wake of redefining marriage? We've seen freedom of religion reduced any time someone's feelings get hurt by traditional teaching and convictions, not just ministers, but private citizens are no longer allowed personal convictions. They are forced to agree with big governments conflicting values. We've seen radical sex education and gender theory forced into public education and even private schools against parents' wishes and even without parents' knowledge. Practicing Jews, Muslims, Christians and Sikhs who want to stay true to their religious teachings can no longer even adopt or foster children in England. Misgendering someone will now potentially earn you jail time in California and Canada. Make no mistake, safe schools being rushed in and forced on us before we even changed marriage was a warning of what will be imposed on our kids without our agreement as parents afterwards. It is not fear-mongering to look soberly at what is happening around us in the world, put one and one together and come up with two. That's just common sense parenting and concern. If you think it's crazy, that an archbishop was hauled before the Tasmanian Anti-Discrimination Tribunal because he offended LGBTIQ plus activists by teaching Catholics about traditional marriage? 
If you think it's gone too far when an 18-year-old is fired for having a Facebook profile supporting traditional marriage. If you agree, get up facilitating a petition to have a family doctor deregistered for unapproved opinions and being an enemy of the revolution is yet another sign that political correctness has already gotten way out of hand and now justice and equality are actually being attacked and eroded, then we simply cannot afford to vote yes. You're not a bigot, a hater, or a homophobe if these things worry you. It's okay to vote no. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Kathy. Um, just before I start tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to take a quick sec to thank uh, Kate for organising this forum tonight. I know it really did snowball very quickly. Started very small and became much bigger. So, Kate, your efforts are, are definitely appreciated. Thank you. Um, before I get into the guts of what I've prepared, I thought I'd just take a quick 30 seconds to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Guy Clifton. Uh, some would know me as Cliffo, that guy off the radio. I am a, a breakfast radio announcer and part-time marriage celebrant as well. I'm a married man myself to a beautiful woman named Michelle, and together we have a three-year-old daughter named Matilda. I wear a lot of hats day-to-day, uh, -day, but one hat that I don't wear is that of a politician. You're not going to hear figures and stats and numbers from me tonight. It's just not my thing. And to be honest, for a while, I, I thought coming here and doing this tonight wasn't my thing. I was going to decline the offer to participate. I didn't think I was good enough or that my opinion mattered enough to be part of something like this. But what made me put myself out of my comfort zone and agree was that I, I want to be able to look my daughter in the eye one day when she's older and tell her that I did my small bit to be on the right side of changing this great country for the better. And the second reason I said yes is it, it doesn't matter that if I, I can't stand up here and, and, and drop stats and figures because I know what I feel. And every bone in my body is telling me it's a basic right for an Australian to stand up in front of the person they love, say some vows, sign some papers, and have that loved recognised by, and have that love, I should say, recognised by this great country. Now, the, the honest truth is you'd be hard pressed to find someone who loves the institution of marriage more than me. I'm a marriage guy. I love being married and I love marrying people. I believe something happens when you marry a person. A new spark enters the relationship. It's hard to pinpoint, but I think all good and loving marriages know the spark I'm talking about. Words simply cannot describe the feeling that I get knowing that I'm married to Mish. It is seriously that special. Now, the celebrant at our wedding actually said something that will stick with me forever. He said, when a person marries their best friend, in a way, nothing changes. But at the same time, everything does. And don't get me wrong, I had a great relationship before marriage. But after saying I do, there really was a new spark. I have a wife now. This is Michelle, she's my wife. And this is Clifford, he's my husband. It's amazing. And denying anyone that spark is so cruel if you don't have a really, really good reason for doing it. And as a beautiful speaker, as David is, I'm still not convinced. As a civil celebrant, I've met with many same-sex couples who want to have a non-legally binding wedding, just the ceremony. And with every single one of those couples, I get a vibe, almost like a, like a sadness, like a bit of a, I guess this is what we'll do for now kind of thing. And it's, it's really not cool. I've been happy to perform non-legal same-sex marriage ceremonies from the, the beginning of my celebrancy. I'll do your, celeb uh, your ceremony now and we'll just rush through the paperwork when it is legal one day. I treat every single ceremony the same. But it's sad that in 2017, in the eyes of the law, that a person's marriage is seen as a bit pretend. In Australia, we're better than that kind of exclusion. It's not how we treat people. 
And some people ask the question, why, when it comes to marriage equality? Why should the law change? The better question is why shouldn't it? Why shouldn't same-sex couples be married? Because you know what's going to happen if same-sex marriage passes? People of the same sex are going to get married. That's it. Some no campaigners are working their hardest to have us believe that this is a vote with far-reaching consequences, that we're not just voting on marriage equality, schools, safe schools, kids, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, it's all affected. It's just not going to be that way. Churches will not be forced to marry gay and lesbian couples. No religious institution can be forced to marry a lesbian or gay couple. If same-sex marriage becomes a reality, the sun is going to rise, Townsville is still going to be on water restrictions, and Jonathan Thurston is still going to be the greatest halfback North Queensland has ever seen. If marriage law changes, same-sex people will get married. That is all that is going to happen. Same-sex marriage is not a slippery slope to anything. The same-sex boogeyman, the same-sex marriage boogeyman is, is not a real thing. The only lives that are going to be affected are the lives of the couples who will finally be able to stand up and declare their love to one another and have that love recognised by the country that they love. In closing, I, I love Townsville, I love living here, I love Australia. This country is built on giving every person a fair go. In Australia, we back our mates and we stand by our neighbours. And the thought of stopping a person from being as happy as I am, from having that magical thing in their lives we call a marriage, because of the person they've fallen in love with, that's not the Australian way. And if you're an undecided voter, please keep in mind that at the end of the day, you're an Aussie. We're Australian. And in Australia, we give each other a fair go. It's time. Please vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thanks to all my uh, fellow panellists for being here, and especially you for turning up tonight. Uh, I'm just thankful the uh, Cowboys aren't playing tonight, because I think if they were, we'd get a much, much reduced audience. Uh, so thanks for, thanks for coming out this evening. And uh, thanks again to Kate uh, for, uh, for all the hard work organising this. I'm Matthew Canavan, a Senator for Queensland, based down the road. Uh, in Rockhampton, one-time Italian citizen as well, you might have read, um, uh, uh, and it's freed me up at the moment to, to get involved in this debate. So it's fantastic to be here to, to be with you tonight because I want to say at the outset uh, I respect and understand all viewpoints in this debate. I particularly think Cliff O has done a, a, an extraordinary and eloquent job at outlining what I view is the best argument to change the Marriage Act. I don't believe we should change the Marriage Act, and I'll explain why, but I do think he's outlined what is the strongest argument for it. And that is, yes, when two people love each other, uh, I can understand, uh, I know myself as a married person, how important that relationship is. But I also actually think that we are missing something if we only view marriage as an act of love. We are missing some of the history and reason why we have an institution called marriage here in Australia. And perhaps more importantly, we're missing why uh, every, every human tribe, uh, uh, culture, uh, and yes, religion, has instituted a form of man-woman marriage as a unique, distinct, exclusive and voluntary relationship. This is not something that's come just out or off the mountain of Mount Sinai uh, when Moses came down. It predates Moses, predates when Moses was a boy. It's not just something that has come from Western culture. Uh, every culture around the world has decided that there's something special, something unique about a male-female exclusive relationship that deserves a distinct recognition in a legal code uh, or other formal uh, arrangement. And I think we should think before we go to change the Marriage Act, why is that the case? What, why has that uh, grown up over millennia uh, uh, in that way? Well, I think um, when I think about my marriage and, and what it means to, for me to be married, I agree with Cliffo. A lot of it was about I love my wife, I love her deeply. But it is 
unfortunate that sometimes people do fall out of love. They do. It's, it's a rather ephemeral uh, human uh, feeling. And I can make this argument because my wife is not here tonight, but let's say I woke up tomorrow morning and decided I was no longer in love with my wife. I don't think it will happen, and again, she's not here tonight, but uh, let's just say that happened. Would I immediately decide that, well, if marriage is just about love, if that's the argument, I should get a, think about a divorce? Would I do that? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I, I would not do that because we have five children, uh, and in my view, children are actually at the centrepiece of why we have marriage. At the centrepiece. We, 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 we know it or should, should remember exactly where the word comes from because part of this debate is just semantic. Part of the debate is about redefining what a word means in our language. So we should, before we seek to do that, understand where the word came from. So marriage in our culture, in, in, in our language, it's not a Jewish word or an Aramaic word. It's, it's a Latin word from Roman culture. It's a, it comes from the Latin root matrimonium. That's how it's evolved over time. And in Latin, matrimonium means two things. Matri means mother, and monium means condition or state of being. So from Roman times, as far back as we can remember, marriage was about the condition or state of becoming a mother, I think a beautiful concept and something that was enshrined in Roman law. And in Roman times, of course, homosexuality itself was a common, uh, uh, common, common and accepted uh, practice, but there was no formal recognition in Roman law for same-sex uh, uh, marriages. These are, this is important, I think, history that we should consider before we rush into uh, changing the underlying fabric of, of our culture and our institutions. And I want to stress that none of that, none of that means that, that a, a homosexual relationship is in any way inferior or below that of a male-female heterosexual relationship. They are, however, different. They are different. And I, I, I think we should celebrate the diversity and richness of human life and human experience. And, and they are different because it is a male-female relationship that in, in, in all, biologically creates the next generation. And I do think every child, every human being, has an innate desire to know their mother, uh, their biological mother and father, and the institution of marriage helps provide the permanence, the security to make sure that happens as often as possible uh, in, in life. It can't always happen for a range of reasons, but the more we can allow uh, young children and as many Australians as possible to know and love their biological mother and father, the better our society, the better our families, the better our community, and the better our country will be. Now, if I can just, in the time I have left, uh, deal with a couple of things that, that Cathy has raised tonight. She has said that in her view, my claim that some on the yes side or the yes activists want to make even the, the view of, how, of ma that marriage should remain the traditional concept of male or female, that some want to make that illegal, she says that's, that's, that's not correct. Well, actually, I think the rhetoric of the yes side belies their ultimate aim here including tonight, Cathy has mentioned that this is a debate about love versus hate. So by implication, uh, she is claiming that those who do have a traditional concept are peddling hate. And I'm very worried about that kind of rhetoric because uh, the logical next step uh, after perhaps, say, if yes, a yes vote gets up and the Marriage Act is changed, is of course to try and outlaw hate and outlaw people uh, from having a different view. And you can see many on the yes side with that view. I also take issue with Cliffo's view that uh, priests and celebrants will always be protected, when in fact I, I can only count, there's 24 bills that have been proposed before the Australian Parliament to change the Marriage Act. By my count, there is precisely one that protects marriage celebrants. Most have protection for priests, they're protected currently in the Marriage Act, but marriage celebrants have generally not been provided protection by the proposed bills. And it is very important very important and crucial that we all recognise that there is no consensus in the Australian Parliament, there is no agreed bill, and a vote for yes in this campaign is a big leap into the unknown. We do not know what bill we end up we're going to get. We do not know what protections will be put in place because there is no agreement on what those protections should be. In fact, only a few weeks ago, just about a month ago, the Labor Party's Shadow Attorney General, Mark Dreyfus, was asked at a round table by a Yes activist, was asked, uh, uh, they, they recognised these protections for priests and celebrants in the uh, Dean Smith Bill, that's a Liberal colleague of mine, the Dean Smith Bill were there, 
but they asked Labor to remove those exemptions when they got into government. And Mark's answer was, and I quote directly, this is an ongoing process. Just as Labor removed protections for aged care in government, we will look to do the same to the Marriage Act when we are in government. That's exactly what their Shadow Attorney General said. So this furphy that priests and celebrants will be protected uh, for good is not correct and there is no guarantees that that will occur. Also, there is never, none of those 24 bills, none of them have provided any protections for schools, for teachers, for small businesses who may not wish to participate uh, in a different view of marriage. So even if priests and celebrants are protected, those providing services to wedding ceremonies do not have the same protections in any of the bills proposed. And likewise, as we've seen and, and as uh, Dave mentioned, in other countries after same-sex marriage has been legislated, uh, schools have been forced to teach a different concept of marriage. Indeed, a Jewish school in the United Kingdom at the moment is facing closure because they're refusing to teach a concept of marriage different from Jewish law. So I, I just say to you that, that if, if uh, you are concerned about religious freedoms, if you are concerned about uh, maintaining parental control of what is taught to children, don't put your trust and faith in politicians. I say, don't, don't, because that's what you're being asked to do. You're being asked to say, uh, if you vote yes, the politicians will look after you. They'll protect all those things. Well, I am a politician and I would say yeah, it's a very brave decision, a very brave decision. I don't know if you've seen the Senate lately, uh, sometimes doesn't always get it right. I would ask you, if you're concerned about those things, please vote no. If you are concerned about political correctness in this country, vote no. If you're scared, if you're worried about safe schools, vote no, because there will be no future vote on safe schools. This is our only chance to stand up to the agenda that's being pushed in our country and to our children and say enough is enough. Thank you very much and God bless. Great. Well, thank you to all of our speakers. Uh, we're going to have a number of questions and they've been, a substantial number have been submitted whilst uh, people have been speaking. We are going to conclude this at about 10 past seven, so we're going to move fairly fast. 10 past eight. We'll conclude when I say, Senator. <laughs> we'll conclude at 10 past eight. And uh, so if we could have about two minutes for an answer, uh, I'll direct the question to somebody and uh, then the opposite uh, team can have a response. Can I direct this to, uh, to you, uh, Cathy? Um, aside from the word marriage or the spark that Cliffo talked about, what discrimination is there uh, against same-sex couples uh, because they're not able to marry, as opposed to, say, a de facto couple or any other kind of relationship? Aside from being able to use the word marriage and have a nice ceremony, what's the discrimination? Well, I think at the moment the issue is um, in a same-sex couple's situation, uh, if they want to adopt children, they can, but only one of the partners can adopt the child. So it's not an adoption as in a traditional marriage. So if, for example, um, the partner who adopted the children passed away, that leaves those children in a very vulnerable position because there's nothing to say that those children have to stay with the other partner. So that is an issue. I think the very fact that we are saying how are they discriminated against by not being able to get married is a point of discrimination occurs. I mean, seriously, I have three children. I've been married for 38 or 39 years. I can't remember which. It's a long time. And I have three children. And one of my children, my youngest child, is gay. It is very difficult for me to look her in the eye and say, I'm really sorry you can't get married like your brother and sister can. Your relationship will not be valued like your brother and sister can. That is, I don't know if any of you are in that position, but let me tell you, it's not a good place to be. I love each of my children for the gifts that they are to my husband and I. But to know that one of my children is denied the fact that she cannot marry the partner 
that she has and she loves and they want to have a family and they want to be married before they have a family. That's a very new and novel approach in the world we live in today. Interestingly, a guy said to me the other day, the rest of us have had to suffer, why the hell can't they? I thought that was really quite funny, but really I it I is... it wasn't a, your husband who said that to you. No, no, but he might think it. Um, but but it, is a, it is really difficult. I mean, we can't talk about, you know, how are they discriminated in any other way other than the fact that they can't get married. That's discrimination. And for me, I live this okay. with my children and I find it very, very difficult. I think my kids deserve the same rights, each, and every, each of them, mm-hmm. and not two of them, and the other one can't have that same right. Uh, Senator David, can you respond to that? Aside from uh, the inability to um, have the ceremony be recognised as married, is there any other discrimination? Well, well Dave touched on it in his, um, in his contribution. Um, we also, uh, in the Nationals Party, uh, commissioned some research by the Parliamentary Library uh, a couple of years ago when this issue came before the Coalition Party Group. And uh, the, the conclusion they came back with was they couldn't find any remaining discrimination, apart from, you know, if you, if you say the Marriage Act is discrimination, obviously that's not my view. But apart from that, they couldn't find any, and that's consistent with Tanya Plibersek's view that, that Dave uh, read out earlier. Uh, there, there, there possibly is some at the state government level, I'm not aware of how our research uh, went obviously to, to federal legislation that we're responsible for. Um, but, but like Dave said, uh, there's remaining legal, financial, uh, next of kin uh, type uh, issues, uh, uh, they, they should be rectified. Um, the, 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 the facts are in this country that you can, whether you're heterosexual or homosexual, you can have your relationship registered as a de facto relationship, uh, which gives you many of the same rights, and, and I might in our analysis all of the same rights at the federal level uh, that we could find. Uh, and that can be done at any time. And it's in fact, it's automatic after two years. If you've lived together for two years, the courts will interpret it as a de facto relationship. And, and look, I, I, I just repeat uh, what I said earlier, I suppose, that I do think there are many differences between us all, that there are different relationships uh, uh, among us all as human beings, brother, sister, mother, father, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and homosexual. Uh, male, female, male, male, female, female. We should celebrate all of those, and that doesn't mean we all. Not all those relationships have differences and, uh, uh, and distinctive aspects. That's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. Uh, I just think we should retain something distinct and unique to recognise that relationship that does create children, which, in my view, is the greatest miracle that, that we uh, uh, see here on, on, on God's earth. Another question for you, uh, Kathy. Um, You talked about a fair country uh, would include uh, families whatever form they take. The question is, would you apply that principle to families that, for instance, were Muslim families wanting to practice polygamy? Would you be fair to them also? Well, I don't think we're actually having that conversation. We're talking about the definition of marriage in the Marriage Act 1961. That's what this debate is. Uh, we're not getting, we're not talking about that. I mean, we live in a world that is changing, and that's obvious when we look around us. What we are here to talk about tonight is the fact that same sex couples have asked for the opportunity to get married. That's what we're here to talk about, to talk about equality. We can't be equal halfway down the street and not equal the other half of the way down the street. I, I guess the question is are you going to apply that principle? No. To- so you would only apply that principle to certain people, not others? We haven't had that conversation yes, about that's polygamy, question. Question so is... that, that's another conversation to be had. Okay. It's something that I haven't turned my mind to. Mm-hmm. But what I will say is, what are we saying about single mothers here or single fathers? What are we saying about uh, single mothers who have children through IVF because they don't have a partner and they desperately want children? What are we saying about their relationships here? What are we saying about those kids? Those kids won't, will not know their fathers or their mothers, potentially. They won't. And that's just how life is. Does that mean that their mother is a bad mother? I don't think so. I think we need to be very careful. And it's really easy to derail a conversation as it's going along by throwing in all of these other myths. One thing I will just say very quickly is, uh, one way that um, same-sex couples can be discriminated against is that end of life. You can have a situation where if you have one partner 
who is seriously ill or dying and the family don't approve of that partner, and it has happened time and time again, uh, the partner can be removed from the situation and the family can come in and take over. I cannot imagine how devastating that would possibly be. So there, there probably are things if we choose to think hard enough about it. Uh, but in terms of the question you've asked me, that's not why we're here. That's another conversation for another day and a lot more research and thought needs to go into that. Uh, but it certainly wasn't high on my priority list, no. Matt and Dave, is that a red herring? No, it's not a red herring. Um, if we're going to apply a system of logic and an argument, argumentation for changing something, we need to not be hypocritical. We need to be consistent. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. So if love is love is the justification for redefining marriage, we have to be consistent with it. There are 193 countries in the world today. Same sex is legal in 23 of them. But polygamy is legal in 58 of them. So if we're going to get with the times and do what the rest of the world is doing on the basis that love is love and government should ratify and justify people's emotions and feelings, we have to be consistent. What other relationship tests would use the exact same arguments to ask for inclusion in the definition of marriage? And there are so many more. And that's it. Any other thoughts on that, Matt? Uh, briefly, a couple of things, James, if that's okay. First first of all, I'm happy to say I will never support the change of marriage act to allow polygamy in this country. Absolutely not. I view it as inimical to women's rights. Uh, uh, other countries and cultures are welcome uh, to do what they like, but I think in this country it's not right to have... Uh, uh, and polygamy only works in one direction in those countries. It doesn't... Women don't get to have multiple male husbands. Uh, it works the other way around. So I, I don't think it's consistent with the the right approach we have in this country of equality between male and females. Um, uh, the second point, just Kathy mentioned single mothers and fathers, and it's an important point. Uh, um, I, I, I accept that we need to discuss these matters with great respect, but I'll, I'll just use my own personal experience as well. My grandmother was a single mother. Um, uh, 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 my dad, does, does, does he think she was a great mum? Absolutely, she was a great mum. Does he feel great loss and heartache about not having a proper relationship with his father because he took off and it's a bit of a no-hoper? Yep, yep, big hole in his life, right? Big, it was a, it was, it's a tragic, it's tragic, tragic when it's happened. Now, life is not perfect, right? Many, many people have to grow up for, for, uh, without uh, the love of both a mother and father for a whole variety of reasons. But that, to me, doesn't mean we shouldn't uh, try to provide as many people as possible with the ideal arrangement, which is that they have a loving and, and continual relationship uh, with their biological mother and father. It does make a big difference in people's lives. And you can see, and, and the IVF examples, you can see this great desire often of, of people who have had no relationship with often their biological father in those cases, but want to find that person, want to track them down. They've got this sort of something in their heart wants to know that person. And, and that's why I, 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 I want to keep that reflected in our marriage laws and our, the way we talk about uh, creating children and creating an environment where there is as, many, many, as much opportunity as possible for people to know and love their mother and father. We've got way more questions than time, but just to be fair, because both of you gentlemen spoke to that, Cathy, do you want to make one quick final comment or Cliffo? Um. I think the, um, the points that we have raised, we're not just talking about marriage equality based on love here. We are talking about principles far deeper than just love. And I, and I understand that. And that's probably the least deciding factor for me. For me, it's more about the human rights side of things and the opportunity for e e uh, equality uh, and people to have choices as others in our community do. So it's, it's very easy too for us to get tangled up into, you know, the love, it's all about love. And of course it is. Of course you want to be with someone that you love, but it's far deeper than that. There's been a couple of questions about uh, the welfare of children. Uh, some of the questions uh, reflect a concern that uh, children being raised in same-sex uh, coupled families um, will be worse off. But I might take this question on the subject, and it's directed uh, to you, Dave. Um, 
The No campaign claim they're concerned about the welfare of children in same-sex relationships, but every week I read of children killed or maimed by their heterosexual parents. I've yet to hear of any crime of this sort perpetuated by a gay parent. Can you talk about that? Sure. Uh, wherever possible, we should do what's in the best interest of children. I, I expect nobody would have difficulty with that topic. Where there's abuse and assault and, and other horrible things which are done to existing children, we should do absolutely everything to remedy that situation and bring justice to the perpetrators. But children, you know, planning legislation that deliberately denies a relationship for a child with one or both of their biological parents is, is depriving them of that necessary natural right to be raised by their biological mother or father deliberately and by design. Not after the fact, not from death, divorce or desertion, and those things are facts of life, but on purpose and planned. And there are many, many children who were raised by loving, same-sex attracted parents whose individual parenting ability is not secondary to anybody else's, but two mothers cannot provide a father, and two men cannot provide a mother. That doesn't make either of them inferior people. It means it's a different household configuration that deliberately denies where the child is created on purpose. Obviously, adopted children are already brought into the world, and, and we have to deal with that as you do. But by design, that's a consequence that's deliberate, foreseeable and avoidable and in the best interests of children that should be avoided wherever possible. I might cut you off there and get a response from Cathy or Clifford. <laughs> um, I don't know where to start really. Uh, I think um, I actually have a sister who is a barrister in the family law court. She deals with lots of trauma, as you could well imagine. She hasn't dealt with any same-sex couples abusing their kids yet. That's not been a case. I have talked to lawyers who work in that space. They have not seen this phenomenon in same-sex couples. When we are talking about children, we are talking the greatest gift that we can have, regardless, in my view, as to whether we are a same-sex couple or a heterosexual couple. Children, are our future. Now, if, if you are saying that people are okay parents, they can't get married, but they're okay parents, and individually, they're fine parents, what are we saying to those children? They're second-class citizens? I don't think so. What children need to be thriving and resourceful and resilient young adults and contribute significantly to our community is to be loved. That's what they need. Talk to kids on the street. They want to be loved. They want someone to love. They want to belong to a family unit or something, to a community. They need an education. They want an education. They need to be safe with a roof over their head. We are not suggesting surely that same-sex couple families aren't safe. I haven't heard anybody say that, so I'll take it that that is a fact that we're not saying. So when we talk about children and we talk about them being good, young Australians, what they need is to be loved. We all, each and every one of us, have the capacity to love children. And it doesn't really matter to me on the configuration of our family. And I think just to finish, it's worth noting and reading both of the banners that are hanging behind me. It really is worth reading those and deeply contemplating what do they mean to humanity and to our society. Can I indulge with a quick personal question, Cathy? Because I, I think I agree with pretty much everything you've said, but could I get your reaction to the comment, ideally, kids should have a mum and a dad. I, in an ideal world, they should have a mum and a dad. Would you agree or disagree? Um, you know, before I well, became aware of the fact that I had a gay daughter, mm. um, 
I probably wouldn't have thought a great deal about that because my life has been pretty ordinary, really, except winning by 37 votes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but to say... But to say that I can't really agree with that, it, it's really very complex for me personally as yeah. a mother, and I know it is for my husband as well. Um, I know my daughter and her fiancé, she's, she's engaged. Um, they will be wonderful parents if they have children. They have a huge capacity. They are great young women. And for me, they deserve the right okay. to be good parents. We're going to finish with two questions. I've saved the safe schools one to last because you all thought that would come up first. But here it is. Uh, there's been numbers of questions on this. I'll just read this one. My grandchildren have already been subjected to safe school program and traumatised by the uh, LGBTIQ uh, content. Uh, the program has become entrenched in the curriculum. Um, if the yes vote wins, am I right in saying and fearing that these programs will gain even more momentum and become entrenched in the education system. Senator? Uh, thanks, uh, James. Look, uh, uh, that is certainly the objective of some uh, in the Yes camp. I'm not saying all, I'm not saying Cathy and Clippo here, but a prominent uh, campaigner for the Yes side, Benjamin Law, who's a Fairfax columnist, has written a whole quarterly essay, uh, which is a, a major periodical in Australia. It's a, usually about 100 pages long. It's written a whole essay about how we need to spread safe schools through our school system and the best way to do it is get same-sex marriage uh, legislated first. And then that's their objective, to, to move on uh, to that front. Look, I'd be a lot more, so that's definitely some people's objectives. I'd be a lot more comforted. I'd be a lot more relaxed about this if there were more people on the yes side of the debate condemning this abominable program. It is truly an abominable program, be teaching the children as young as 11 years old, uh, role playing, uh, uh, highly sexualised material, uh, it, it, it should not be taught to 11 year old children, should not be taught. But I never hear anyone on the yes side offer a word of criticism of the program. And, and yes, some don't then say it should be spread out and those things, but I'm just concerned, I'm just concerned, as I've mentioned, in the UK and in Canada as well, we've seen the rollout of these radical gender theories in schools immediately following the legalisation of same-sex marriage. We need to protect against that. At the very least, it would be good to see those on the S side say, okay, we're going we're to put some protections for the Marriage Act to make sure that doesn't happen. No proposals, as I said, for that. Can I ask a quick question? Why do you suppose that same-sex marriage presupposes uh, a continuation of safe schools? It's already happening. Well, I think what will happen, uh, James, is it will gain uh, a lot more uh, traction uh, uh, in, in uh, state governments that are pushing this agenda. In Victoria, they've already made it mandatory. Uh, in schools, in Queensland, unfortunately, uh, it is not mandatory, but you cannot know which schools have it. So, sorry to interrupt, Senator, but that, that's kind of my point. It's already happening. How is same-sex marriage going to change in Well, I think in life, you're best to look at the record of uh, experience. And, and, and in any debate, it's best to look at what's happened in other countries. And that's exactly what has happened in the United Kingdom and uh, in, in Canada. And I do fear that the same thing will happen here, as I say. So for some, it's their clear objective. It is exactly what they are intending to do. Clifford, Cathy, um, is the fear concerning safe schools becoming entrenched in the education system, is that a valid fear? Um. No, it's not a valid fear for me. What I do know is that research has found that 80% of children experience uh, homophobic and transphobic incidents in school. Now, I haven't read the Safe uh, Schools Program because I don't have any children in school, so I'm not an expert on this. My understanding, though, is, well, certainly in Queensland, it's a choice. Um, I can assure you, I can assure you that if I had a child in school and I was concerned about it, that would be one of the first questions I would be asking when I went to the school to look at enrolling my child. So I would be asking. Um, and we, have, we are so fortunate in this city, we have wonderful schools and in this country, we have choices that we can make. Uh, so we don't have to send our children to particular schools. So if it, that were the case, 
uh, you could not send your children to that school. We have that choice. Um, I, I tend to think that it is happening now. If we get same-sex marriage, it will make no difference to, to save schools because they're funded out of a completely different space and it's a completely different conversation. If we have 80% of children in schools being bullied and abused, we need something to ensure that those children's mental health is not destroyed. Let me be really clear about this. I spent 15 years in the mental health community sector before I came into this job. I cannot tell you how many young men that I worked with in supporting who went through school, who were homosexual, who were bullied to the point where they attempted suicide and ended up in the acute unit at the hospital here and their lives were destroyed. That is unacceptable and I'm sure that Matt and David would agree with me on that and certainly Cliff I would. That is unacceptable. Now whether or not the Safe Schools program is the program we want, as I said I haven't read it, I'm not prepared to comment on that. But I do know we cannot have our children in that situation. And what I do understand also about the Safe Schools program, teachers are very much involved in the process and the students are as well. So it's not like it's open slather, we can do whatever we like. Schools have a choice here. That's my understanding. So I'm not prepared to make a, a, a blank, you know, blanket comment. I don't know, I haven't been to every school and asked them. But as a parent, I can assure you, if it were my worry, I'd be asking. When I went to the school, I'd ask. Just, we've got to finish, but based on the number of questions we've had on this, let me give it one or two more minutes because a lot of people have raised this issue. Matthew? A legitimate anti-bullying program. There's no question about that. It's unacceptable in schools. Uh, I, I fully support uh, the rollout of such programs. But uh, I, I know Cathy wasn't in the parliament when this program was funded. Uh, but it was funded by a former Labor government. Uh, uh, it was funded by Penny Wong. At the last election, uh, Cathy did stand uh, on a Labor platform which called for the increased in future funding of the Safe Schools uh, program. Uh, and I tell you what, I tell you what, if there is a no vote, it comes back. If a no vote comes back, it will change things in this country. It will be like those other votes overseas we've seen. And safe schools will be stopped in its tracks. That is absolutely true. Because it will be seen as a fundamental rejection of this kind of ideology. And we'll have a changed direction in this country. Last question, and we're going to make this a fast one. Bearing just, in mind... Can I just make a 15 second comment to the bullying comment? Um, I was worried, like Cathy said, my kids were in primary school. I wrote to my principal, his principal, and said, are you teaching safe schools? And they said, no, we already have a very effective bullying program. That's all I want to say on that. Last question. Uh, bearing in mind that at the last census, only slightly more than half of the people who responded indicated uh, a, a adherence to the Christian faith, uh, why should religious people impose their view of marriage in a secular society? Might start with you, Cliffo or Kathy. Would you like to address that? Check, check. Ah, off to a wonderful start. And if anyone at the end has any questions about celebrancy or the cowboys, I'll be able to nail that. Like I said at the start of my presentation, politics is certainly not my point. Um, what was the question again? I, I even tuned out. I had a great answer as well, but I, then I thought about Bearing the Bearing in game. mind only slightly half of the census response well, indicated a faith in Christianity, why should religious and, people and, impose their and, view of marriage? And this is one thing I do know about, the, the, the number of people, and I mean we all know this, it's, you can't, can't debate it, that year on year the numbers of people getting married outside of religious organisations is on the rise drastically. I think the latest count last year was 77%. Look, speaking on behalf of the celebrants, um, and I can't, I, I can't speak on behalf of all of them, but I can certainly speak on behalf of my network. Um, we we want to marry people of the same sex. That's that's what we want to do. Um, I know a lot of people of the same sex that want to get married, want to get married by celebrants, and I. I I think the last thing I would want in my wedding is to be married by someone who doesn't want to marry me. It's just not going to happen. Let's be real, you know. Um, and that's all I have to say on that, unless anyone has any Cowboys questions for now. <laughs> Thank you. Religious imposition. Look, there's three definitions of the word secular, and people use that word, we're a secular society, and it depends which definition you're using. So in France, there is a complete 
ban on expressions of religion in the public space, in government buildings, government schools, etc. You're not allowed to wear a cross, you're not allowed to wear a hijab, nothing at all. Zero religion. We're not that kind of secular society. In England, there's an official religion of the nation, but heaps of the nation are agnostic or atheist. We're not that kind of secular society. In Australia, we have a pluralistic, inclusive, secular society, which means everybody has an equal voice. There is no official state religion. You can believe anything you want, or you can believe nothing. But whatever you believe, you have an equal voice to everybody else in society. You know who gets to impose their beliefs in a democratic, pluralistic, inclusive, secular society? 50% of the electorate plus one. The majority rules. It's not an imposition of religious beliefs. It's an imposition of common beliefs. 49% have to suck it up until the next election. But 51% of us get to say what we want. So if, if a vast majority, like a third of people are religious and another third agree with them, that's what happens. If a third of people are religious and two thirds aren't and the religious people lose, that's what happens. What we have in Australia and what we should have is a contest of ideas with everybody, one man, one person, one vote. So there is no imposition of religious values. Argue, look, I love the Bible, I love the Word of God, but if I'm talking to somebody who doesn't care, I'm not even going to bother quoting it. So if somebody quotes scripture at you, worst case scenario, you walk away unpersuaded. That's the worst thing that happens with people having religious opinions in Australia, because it is, at the end of the day, a contest of democracy. You have to persuade a majority of people to agree with you, or you're not going to get your way. There is no imposition other than democratic majority. Very good. I'm going to invite Kate to come and uh, thank our speakers tonight. Well, um, I don't know about you guys, but I have been very impressed with the calibre of all the speakers this evening. Um, I would like to thank them again, Senator Matt Canavan, Dave Pello, Guy Cliff o Clifton, and Kathy O'Toole. Uh, federal member for Herbert. I've also been impressed with you guys, the audience, because I know there are things that um, must be challenging to hear and, and you've all done very, very well. Thank you. I would like to thank James for moderating. He did a great job. Um, quickly like to thank the team of volunteers. We've got Cato, Denny, Doug and Michael and I would uh, also like to thank Peter and I would also like to thank Jess who's done an amazing job. So again, thank you so much. We will have a little bit of time. Time has gone well, so we will have some time to mingle afterwards. Thank you. We've had a really great debate tonight. It was respectful, it was robust, we each got to make our points and it was great to see so many people from the Townsville community come along this evening and congratulations to the crowd as well because they were very respectful and listened and uh, took note of what everybody said and I've had a chat with people uh, since we finished and uh, by and large people have been very respectful again in the conversations that I've had with them after the event. So congratulations to Kate for organising it because I think Townsville uh, has hosted a very successful marriage equality forum. <laughs> What a fantastic privilege to be uh, speaking to the community at Townsville tonight. It was fantastically organised by Kate Horan, and uh, what a great lineup of people from both sides of the argument, notably Cathy O'Toole and Senator Matt Canavan, and of course Cliffo. It was really great having them all participate, but it was good to not just be talking to the echo chamber. There were people in the audience who were supporting either side and people talking to the audience from, from either side. One of the points that I want to clarify is that the most progressive secular court in the world, the European Court of Human Rights, has consistently said homosexual marriage is not a human right. Saying it is over and over and over again is an opinion and at best a legal argument which has been rejected by a secular progressive court. It's simply not a fact, it's an opinion.
and uh, we can't argue that it's, that it's a human right. Marriage certainly is, but so is the right to be raised by your biological mother and father wherever possible. But what a great respectful debate tonight. We're not sure how this goes. We're certainly not in Victoria, that's for sure. In Queensland, they're respectful, balanced and intellectually honest people. So good luck to the rest of Australia keeping up with that great standard. And uh, thanks again to everybody for their involvement tonight. All right, um, David, thank you for the, the opportunity to, um, to star on your, your YouTube channel. Um, you're a fantastic man, even though we don't agree on this issue. It's been wonderful to, to get to know you and debate something we both believe in passionately. Um, all, all I want to say is that, yeah, I mean, I, I just, and I said at the start of my presentation tonight, I'm, I'm not big on politics. You know, I'm not big on, um, on, on figures and numbers and statistics and stuff, but I, I know what I believe in my heart. Um, I'm a father myself, I'm a marriage celebrant, um, and I, I, I really, really believe it's time for equality. Um, and yeah, I just, I'm gonna vote yes, and that's, you know, well, I'm, and t tonight we've had a good chat, we've agreed on a lot of things, that's one big one that we definitely disagree on, um, but it's been yeah, great to meet you, and um, thank you for the, uh, the words on the YouTube channel. It's great to have been here and participated in the marriage forum in Townsville tonight. Uh, really ably organised by Kate Four, and it's been a great discussion. Great to have so many people come out and talk about a really important issue. Had a very respectful debate, uh, and both sides were able to put their position, which is what should happen uh, during this survey. Uh, some great questions from the floor, and from my perspective, uh, I still think. Uh, that a yes vote raises more questions than answers. Uh, a no vote gives you the certainty of what we've had for uh, hundreds of years in this country and millennia uh, around the world. Uh, it's, there are some serious issues, serious questions about what are the consequences of voting yes. What are the consequences for people's freedom to, to espouse a different view about marriage, a traditional view about marriage? What are the consequences for schools and parents and what they are allowed or can control is taught to their children. And those questions remain unanswered. And if you're concerned about those issues, I'd ask you to vote no.